Hi. Welcome. We're, we're Microbiology Twitter Journal Club, where we're here to talk about all things great that are small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life, I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. But nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC, dedicating to an aim of the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and in a previous life, I finished a PhD in, in uh, microbiology, where I made bacteria glow in the dark, and I worked on vaccines and various other things. And since then, I've worked in research integrity, and now I, I'm an editor for an academic journal. Uh, every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today is our deep dive week, uh, where we look at each figure in a paper that we chose last week uh, to learn and criticize the scientific findings. Um, it's a journal club, and we want everyone in our audience to leave us questions and comments. Yeah, and next week will be our, our news week, where we look at uh, various different types of article. And if you want to suggest any articles for us to look at, then please pipe down in the comments. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I think. And, uh, oh, and in the doobly doo, we have a link to our Zotero. Uh, that is where you can look at all the papers that we have been reading. <clears throat> yes, and today is Valentine's Day, where we celebrate our love of science. <laughs> yeah, immunology. Nothing says Valentine's Day than some very technical immunology. <laughs> Absolutely, and today is going to be a very technical immunology paper, where the title of the paper is uh, is. Uh, is in my notes somewhere. Um, <laughs> Let's see, I think I have it yeah, up the... here. Comprehensive analysis of T cell immunodominance and immunoprevalence of SARS CoV 2 epitopes in COVID 19 cases. Yeah, so this is, uh, so I mean, this is a paper. So uh, the reason I, I really wanted to do this paper is because there's news we've been focusing a lot on the antibody responses, especially to these new strains of coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. And so you, so you've seen like maybe like every week there's like a new paper talking about this South African strain or the B one seven strain and how the antibodies might not bind to it as effectively as you would expect. But the antibodies mm -hmm. aren't the big biggest part of the immune system. There's a whole other set of of cell based immunity that we ha we aren't really talking about and we haven't really talked about the effects that mutations could potentially have on that. So that's why I'm going to be uh, that's what we will be focused on today. Today we're going to be focused on the T cells. So um, so like in another part, so, another part of the immune system. <laughs> yeah. So on to the my first like kind of picture is just a brief image of the infection cycle. And there are two like main phases that the virus is vulnerable in. It's either outside the cell where it can be attacked by antibodies or inside the cell where it can be attacked by T cells. Um so yes. uh, we're gonna be <laughs> These viruses are like a really bad breakout. <laughs> oh yeah, they they're really bad. You you don't want them. It's <laughs> heartbreaking uh but yeah so i mean the, the idea is that t-cells do look at your cells to check whether but they can't see inside of them so you have to check what stuff that's on the surface yes and so and uh, uh, in previous in previous studies they've seen uh that t-cells do get elevated in severe um cases of SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> yes and uh, specifically, oh, oh yeah, specifically they like, I think look at um, like memory. They think that the T cells that are getting upregulated are memory T cells. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there are also maybe two types of T cells we're going to talk about. This slide shows us CD4 T cells. And then the next slide shows us that um, there are CD8 T cells. But the same, the same thing, right? That basically um, people that... Uh, like don't get a uh, healthy controlled serum, right? Uh, does not have these populations of T cells in them, but those that have the severe COVID-19, uh, they, they are getting this sort of uh, increase in the cell compartment. Yeah, so to try the show, you'll hit, people will be hearing CD4 and CD8 T cells thrown out a lot. And CD4 are the T helper cells. So they help the immune response by kind of almost being like the brain of the immune response where they co communicate with B cells and T cells and, and produce these, chemical messages that help them activate and yep. cd8 t cells are the fun ones because they get kill cells so yeah cd8 is definitely more of the like we'll say like effector i think they do call them yeah. that sometimes effector. yeah effector yeah mm -hmm. uh actually the next slide should give us some clarity on that uh yep. this is basically from like a little overview and you can kind of see there's two arms to the immune system yep uh like one arm can be thought of as being instigated by the cd4 cells and the other arm being instigated by the cd8 uh and importantly like what 
is required to go down either arm is the recognition of antigen, <laughs> right. uh, which is this foreign object, right, that we can ingest. I mean, that's a huge area of research. Mm. Like, how do you determine, um, like, antigen from non-antigen, right? Like, that's um, autoimmunity and stuff, like, gets into that area. But uh, for the sake of our discussion, right, like these foreign things, virus pieces, bacterial pieces, get picked up by antigen presenting cells, um, which can be a whole bunch of different things, and they get presented to CD4 or CD8, and the context matters, and that uh, causes either um, going down the CD8 effector pathway, where it's killing things that live inside of cells, or down the humoral immunity pathway, where B cells grow and antibodies are made. <clears throat> right. So the main like molecule that we're going to be talking about a lot is this thing called major his so MHC so uh, mm -hmm. MHC class one and MH MHC class two um, so they co they stands for a major histocompatibility complex and there are two f flavors for it one of it is f so MHC one is found on basically all cells mm -hmm. and the other one is mainly found on antigen presenting cells so cells who basically like they they eat up cellular garbage and they go to your like lymph nodes and then they uh, show yeah. off to the CD4 and CD8 T cells and B cells just to make, and then yeah. from there, the immune response can grow. I would say that, you, know, you were saying earlier, like CD4 cells are like, kind of like the brains, definitely antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, this style. Mm. Like, because they're able to present antigens, I think, to both types of cells, essentially, like, the chemical signals that are coming off of them will be helping to form, like, which direction the immune response goes. Definitely. And we've mentioned it before. It's super complicated. This is, like, a type of simplification that people use to understand, like, all the mechanisms that happen. But there's crosstalk between these two systems, right? Like, uh, you know, like, the production of antibodies could feed back into other things. People are discovering new stuff all the time um, along these. But but it's a really this framework does explain a lot of the data that's out there and it's a really useful way of thinking about um, the immune response um, and I just want to say uh, the other molecule that we should think about we don't say it a lot probably during talking about this paper but it is there is the t-cell receptor which is on the other side right <laughs> that's yeah. the receptor that is recognizing the antigen that's being presented on the MHC <clears throat> yeah and the t-cell receptor it needs to have the MHC molecule there to, to bind to the peptide right yeah, or... yeah. And yeah, that, so like one cell like picks up the pro the antigen epitope, shoots it out, right, and then the other side grabs it and is like, okay, this looks like something. <clears throat> yeah, so just to simplify it a, a bit more, because I've done some images uh, where yeah. the T cell interacts with the, the your cell, but the question is, how does that antigen get to the surface? What happens to make it? So, so the T cell is looking at the MHC that has the antigen on it, but where does that come from? So let's so let's go back to simple. Your virus enters into your your cell. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, it starts vomiting out its DNA, its like geno genome, so it'd be RNA in this case. Uh, and that <laughs> RNA goes off and gets uh, replicated. So usually the cell would replicate its own proteins, uh, but now it's the virus is forcing it to replicate its own proteins. So mm -hmm. uh, because of that, it, these proteins end up going, well, all proteins end up going to this thing called the proteasome, which I tend to think of as kind of like wood chipper, where... <laughs> yeah. Like, it takes like all these old proteins that the cell they're kind of like either misfolded or they're slightly damaged and they get given a signal and they get sent to this proteasome where they get chopped out into smaller pieces and eventually uh, -huh. uh they that gets recycled but I'm a little some of those pieces by this proteasome that you're drawing it's like wood chipper is like uh frozen bodies or like, stuff yeah. like that wood chipper I, mean, I, I saw Fargo let's <laughs> 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 yeah, and these these MHCs are hanging out on the other side of that wood chipper to pick up any fragments of protein. And when they pick up those fragments, those get sh expressed on the surface. And also another thing in nomenclature is you've got MHC, which stands for major histocompatibility complex, but it's also referred to as human leukocyte antigen. So yeah. we might oh. end up using those words interchangeably. You know, it can be a bit confusing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to always say HLA, actually, because that's how the paper talks about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So like for, yeah, but you know, good to point that out. Yeah, well, they're definitely interchangeable terms. Yeah, it confused <laughs> me so much when I was studying immunology. I kept looking up each one and it took me ages to figure out they're the same thing. But, yeah. <laughs> so when the T cell sees an, an antigen it doesn't like, that's when it knows to go crazy. Um, so yeah, going into the details of MHC class one, also known as a HLA class. Uh, so they, they have a wide range of epitopes. So that's where it comes into this thing called human leukocyte antigen typing. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess the if you can see from this, this is like a molecular image, right, of that MHC clamp. And it like pinches down on two parts of the peptide. So the stuff in the middle between those two parts, it can be anything, mm -hmm. right? And that's sort of what uh, that gives, like that's the variability part, right? Like, but the fact that it does clamp down <laughs> on either side means that there's gonna be a bias. Um, that like there are some things that are encoded in people's genetics, right? That bias where it can clamp. Um, and yeah, I guess we should go to the next slide uh, because the way that evolution has dealt with this bias is that um, there are tons of different types of MHC uh, classes, uh, all alleles, right? Those are variants of a gene. Um, and those alleles are expressed codominantly, which means that like both types that you have uh, get made. And so you have four different alleles of HLA based on two from your uh, biological mom and two from your biological dad. Um, and yeah, those come together to give you this diversity and people call that a haplotype. Hmm. Um, and that is like you can see in this little chart, right? Like there are some amazing numbers of variants. As you can imagine, if that can be all assorted, uh, basically everyone has a fairly unique haplotype. <clears throat> and I think this plays into disease. Uh, so there are lots of human mutual antigen variants, but it plays into diseases because they might not bind the same way. There is going to be a bias in there. So yeah. let's say <laughs> if we chop out, chop up the SARS-CoV-2 genome into individual peptides and we throw them at the different HLA types, we'll find that different HLA types might bind it to it differently. A little bit better, yeah. So yeah. that means they present it better. So that means that those things would be the ones that, you know, your immune system recognizes. <clears throat> so this is something you have to, we, that has to be taken into account when you're looking at T cell responses, because there is going to be that diversity in responses of antigen presentation. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things this paper will look into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you may remember that we did look at T cells binding epitopes uh, very early during the pandemic. There were these reports with actually very uh, like confusing results <laughs> uh, showing that even in uninfected uh, individuals, you could find T cells that responded uh, to antigen. Um, and what they did, they also showed that um, uh, in people who were infected by SARS-CoV-2 or by classic SARS, they showed both, uh, that those people had T cells that uh, were more, that uh, that responded more to certain proteins inside of SARS-CoV-2. So they focused on, I think, a specificity for uh, the nuclear protein. Uh, mm -hmm. Or they were trying to look at uh, do the dominance of nuclear protein over NSP, non-structural proteins. Right. Um, and they were saying, oh, it gets enriched. Um, but if you synthesize that with the information we just told you, like there is that bias. If they only looked at so many people, right, uh, we actually don't know whether or not that bias is just from how they chose the people, right? It could be from all the different MHC. They chose people all in the same MHC class. And so like that's why they presented like this. <clears throat> exactly. And next slide, we've also looked at uh, previous markers of T cell activation. So... Oh, yeah. Is, I don't think we looked at this before. It's just that um, this is like, I guess, an important thing to understand going into this paper is that uh, there's been a lot of work on like uh, seeing like how do you check if the T cells are being activated by these antigens. Mm -hmm. So in that previous paper, they did um, fluorospot ELISAs. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that one, they sort of treat cells with uh, a little bit of the antigen, but also some cytokines, or sometimes there's other stimulations that they use. And, and it's supposed to recapitulate like the event right. <laughs> inside the body, right? Where the cell like, oh, I found an antigen and now it's getting signals. So if it expands, it means that it is uh, recognizing that antigen and, and going down that path. But, um, and we talked about this actually in the last episode as well, like uh, that could also just be naive cells getting activated yeah. because like, when you're adding chemical signals and things like, you know, the immune system's a big place and like there could be some very active cells that decide, oh yeah, this is the thing that we want to do. Even though they've never, the body's never seen that antigen before, they just happen to be in the right place at the right time to expand. Um, so there's been some previous work on this method called activation-induced markers, uh, which basically we leverage our favorite um, immune technique of flow cytometry yeah. uh, to look um, to specifically look at markers that get expressed on the outside of those cells when they're being activated. 
Um, and so in this way, they actually only give the antigen in these types of tests, and it's sensitive enough uh, because flow cytometry, again, is looking at like every cell. You look at like 10,000 events or something, 100,000 cell events, and you see like, uh, do you have an enrichment of a certain marker on those cells? <clears throat> and if you see it, then it means, oh, they, they're recognizing the antigen. And so this, this figure here, B, is just showing like intracellular staining, which is using the, uh, is not as sensitive as AIM. Mm. Uh, so using yeah. and stuff to stimulate things, it actually doesn't, it's, this is an even more sensitive method because it's looking at facts. <clears throat> yeah, so going back to the, the T cell getting angry, it's, it expresses like stuff on its surface. So in this case, I've just depicted as tears of anger. As, as, <laughs> but like those could be surface molecules like CD69, nice. Uh, OX40, CD137. Uh, so these are kind of expressed at different points during the T cell activation. So sometimes it can be, because so, the thing is, the problem with choosing just one marker is sometimes a marker will appear for only a few hours after it's it's been <laughs> activated, but then you want to make sure that you, if you're getting a T cell that's been activated a bit later, then something more long lasting. Uh, so that's why having a panel of markers is better for finding out which T cells are activated. Absolutely. Yeah. So if we, so the best way to think about this is a research tool, right? They don't have to know what CD69, OX40, and CD13 or uh, 137 are, right? Like they're just. Um, there's just things that were empirically determined down the line, right? And different controls were done to make sure that the cells that are expressing these in early phases are the activated ones from antigen. Yeah. I mean, I did go on Wikipedia and I did look up there what they did anyway. Oh, nice. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, CD137 is induced when T cells are induced, and that's basically the amount of what I could get from that. Uh, <laughs> OX40 is a secondary co immune checkpoint molecule, so essentially it's a regulator, so it reacts to certain ligand. Uh, CD69, nice, uh, is a C-type lectin that's encoded by a gene. So it's, uh, again, it's, they all do, do various tasks related to the T-cell signaling and the regulation of how, because when you activate a T-cell, you want to make sure you're activating for the right thing. So there are all these checkpoints and all these like, kind of regulatory things that they try to make sure to, make mm -hmm. sure that they're not reacting against self. You, you yeah. don't want a T-cell to react against your own body. So, uh, nice. But okay, yeah. so that, that's actually a really good, that also gives us confidence that they're choosing relevant markers, right? If there are sort of relevant biological functions to them, we can feel even more confident, right? That like this AIM marker p panel is showing us some sort of form of activation. <clears throat> yeah. And... Um, and so they do this AIM <laughs> technique um, to basically uh, a whole panel of SARS-CoV-2 genes. And this is before they even enter this study, right? And just mm -hmm. say like, oh, look, like maybe like because this result of seeing um, a, like a healthy serum respond to uh, antigens is kind of confusing, right? Like mm -hmm. I guess uh, one of the ways people have thought about it, and it was in Le the Lebert paper, they said this as well, is it could be like uh, the seasonal coronaviruses, right? There's some cross-reactivity or whatever. Um, so they did this to try to get a sense of what was going on. It works. You can see like <laughs> they have had sensitive results where, and you can see there's also more uh, reactivity, right, in the infected serum or the infected cell populations than the uninfected. Uh, but yeah, that's not enough for these authors. They are looking for more information. And that's where our paper begins. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I guess specifically, you know, with all the HLA background we've been giving people, like it's because right, they think that if they have a bigger cohort size, then they can uh, see like all the different types of MHC and they can remove that potential confounder from their analysis. Um, so yeah, they're going to look at T cells. They're from uh, uh, PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So all of their participants are getting bled. There are donors, blood donors. Um, what we'll not like to give to people for research, <laughs> blood donors for research. Um, yeah, and they're going to take those cells out and they're going to treat them and see what what goes on. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean they, they've got also, a quite a diverse population because they want to have fairly diverse pe people in there because you want to get as many HLA types as possible. Um, yep. Uh, they also have a diversity of, I think, like the onset of disease. So, like, all these people are at like different stages, right? Of like, yeah. where they got sick. Uh, we're not like looking for like just early or just late. They're just trying to mix it all up. So, we're getting an overview of what the T cells respond to. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's both a good thing and it could also like bite them later if they have too much variance because if you, if you go out <laughs> looking for variance, you get variance. So, it makes it harder to 
so you have to like have quite big samples you have to have quite like int- like g- quite strong analyses to try and figure stuff out um yeah the phenotype that they're seeing has to be strong enough to rise from the noise, right? Because yeah. in variance, you're going to have people that are low and high. Like you want to, in the average of all that effect has to be higher than noise, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can understand why people are enthusiastic about antibodies because they're quite simple compared to T cells to figure out what your responses are. Whereas T cells, you have to play with HLA types, you have to play with cells, you have to do all these other analyses to, to get things, to figure out what's going on. <laughs> um, and so in this next figure in S1, uh, they're showing us uh, more explicitly that the HLA types that are present in their uh, pop- in their cohort, uh, which is in uh, the open bars, uh, are comparable to the frequencies of the HLA types that you see in a worldwide population. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it at least seems it seems like every HLA type is at least like represented once in this. Yeah, yeah. I guess like if you really look closely at the bars, HLA-B looks like they have some enrichment for certain types over others yeah. uh, in particular type. Uh, HLA-DP, DPB1, <laughs> they're also seeing some enrichment there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to get a representative sample without sampling the entire world. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, so, I'm, so I'm, I appreciate they made the... And they also appreciate they've actually shown us this kind of variation and, and mm-hmm. expressed... Because no, this also means that they can actually uh, account for this later in the paper. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, they are aware, right? Like, mm. they want to show us something useful. I think that that's the big takeaway here, right? Is that they want this uh, paper to be this overview. And so if they're not giving us all the background, it's not going to be a useful overview. <laughs> right. And that brings us to to figure, well, figure 1A, where they've chopped up all these, these the, the genome into, like, tiny little beast pieces and they've Mm -hmm. shown it to t-cells to see what makes them angry what doesn't make them angry yes yeah so every dot here is is a flow cytometry plot (laughs) yeah Um, so like it's a lot of stuff that they did um but you know it's made easy because they have this good panel of uh, these AIM right markers mm. that they can look for, and they can say, oh, here's relative over control where they see uh, more response. And you can see there's there's actually a big response to in both CD8 and CD4 in the spike protein. <clears throat> yeah. So the the blue bars are basically like no response, and the red bars are like some response. Yellow is also some. Oh, sorry, not yellow. I mean white is some response, and each ind- and the x-axis is basically individual people. So yeah. when you see a white line, that means that this that lots and lots of people are reacting to this specific protein. So mm-hmm. for spike, especially in CD8, you can see there's a uh, big big red uh, bulges there, and yep. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and in other proteins as well. So and that, yeah, that, looks like NSP3 is pretty high. Lots of reacting in NSP3 in the M protein. Yeah, um, M is like. Um, M is a structural protein. It's on the yeah, surface. The matrix the protein, I think, all is called. And so there's quite a lot of M, uh, M protein around because that's used to build the virions up. Uh, yeah. And then the M protein is the one that's actually b- building the virions. Oh, N protein. Yeah. Oh, nuclear right. caps. No, oh. uh, M protein is like uh, uh, is. Uh, holding on to the genome but then m i think is in the membrane because <laughs> e is envelope right so like e is something is also very prevalent but it doesn't yeah. seem to give us as much of a, a response <clears throat> right uh yeah i'll i'll look it up in on google uh, quickly but now yeah. it brings us to table s3 where we we're essentially like they're looking at the different proteins and seeing how quickly how I said, how much of the how much of the overall response of every cell that they sent through flow <laughs> uh, does the each protein represent? Right. So they they order them by which ones are like the frequency of how frequently they they see responses or how frequently donors uh, are positive for them. Right. That's because they have a big cohort. They have a hundred they have a hundred different people. Right. So there's going to be yeah. variance amongst everything. And what they want to know or how they how they sort of uh, put their cutoffs for immunodominance is once they uh, explain 80%, over 80% um, of the the positive results, right, can be explained through just this top eight or top nine uh, antigens. So that's that's their argument for immunodominance, right, across right. this 
cohort of 100 different people, right? When you test their uh, PBMCs, right? Uh, some of them, they all have different, they all come positive for different antigens, right? But uh, what are the top ones that come out that can explain 80% of all the positive results? Right, and those are the... Oh, sorry, yeah. I was gonna say, it's kind of an arbitrary cutoff. Yeah, it is kind of, but I mean, you have to find a cutoff somewhere, and I think they've gone about like 30, They've, they've picked up a way so they can focus on a small number of proteins, but that are more likely to to have bigger effects in all sorts of other places. And I think they covered most of the big ones that we that we tend to focus yeah. on. Yeah, and I think that the other thing that maybe I didn't understand when, like, reading through this paper sequentially, I didn't really understand that what they're driving towards is is first of all an understanding an overview of like the antigens that tickle our our t cells right but they're also driving towards a research tool <laughs> um to like make something that can stimulate our t cells right in a sars cov2 dependent manner um so that's also i think part of the way that they draw their cutoffs is because they don't want to have like these little detailed like oh yeah this random peptide on this random protein can stimulate right uh uh some small percentage of people who are infected they're looking for like the epitopes that are stimulating everybody in general so that's why they go with like a they're going for like the big explainers the things that explain a lot of variants <clears throat> Yeah. Um, so yeah. In the oh, did you look up this M N protein thing? Oh, I did. It's uh, the membrane protein. So there's so it makes up like the viral envelope. So M membrane protein envelope and spike make up the viral em envelope. I'm still okay. looking up N protein. Uh, uh, N, N is the genome. Yeah, I think that, that wraps up the genome, right? And yeah, print, yeah. So, so N is also actually so envelope and M are probably pretty uh, like high abundance yeah. but yeah you don't really see that large response from envelope it seems <clears throat> yeah interesting uh so yeah and then uh, it's energy three like that's non-structural i think we read about it i think it does have some effects right inside of the cell like in terms of um like changing the transcription translation or nsp1 is also so like yeah we we on some of these before i think nsp3 is also very uh, um abundant right so abundance definitely co correlates with this is something that people just already know abundance of proteins will correlate with whether or not they're epitopes for <laughs> cd4 and cd8 yeah. right <clears throat> because even if they're like crappy epitopes they'll still there'll be enough there that at least one or two of them will bind so that'll be enough to create yeah response. yeah some cell in your body would have sniffed it out and been like uh anyone seen this before <laughs> <laughs> oh. And that brings us to 1CD, uh, which uh, yeah. is... Uh... It's basically just bringing out the data that we saw in 1A and B a little bit differently by 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 protein. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think... And they put the little dots on it to show us the ones that uh, were above their cutoff criteria for immunodominance. <laughs> yeah, uh, it does really show how variable the immune reaction can be. Uh, I mean... Look... It's huge. <laughs> the spreads are like... Even in the ones that are really high, they have members, right, who are down there at the bottom, right, which you wouldn't consider an increase at all. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean, because the immune dom they mark the immune dominant ones with dots, and you can sort of see like the boxes are a bit more higher. That kind of the boxes the, the boxes kind of show where the averages are, but the dots yeah. show the outliers. So you can see there's always some there's at least one person who's reacting to something yeah. there. So. I I think in this case, the dots are probably every data point, just because oh, they're right. so yeah. evenly distributed everywhere and they jittered them. So like you can see in like S protein on the CD4 plot, like there's some horizontal width <laughs> as well to those, right? right? So as they map them, all the ones that were the same, they jittered them so you could see how many. So S, oh. like that's a very strong, this is my favorite way to show data. Yeah. I, I thought right back in the day, I thought when my supervisor was showing data because I always, I. It's messy, I understand, but jitter plots really show people like these are the data points, right? Like they're not hiding things under the averages. The average is still easily readable from this yep. and uh, the type of variance. <clears throat> and uh, the great thing I like about this is if you want to say at home, measure each dot in publisher and try to <laughs> do your own data analysis, this allows that, which is actually <laughs> great for open science. Uh, I mean, there are various like, sure. other graph plotting softwares, but yeah, this is. Uh, Absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, hopefully for open science, they would just deposit this Excel file, right, <laughs> or whatever they use into into a database. But yeah, you know, as we yeah. saw in our news episode <laughs> last week, uh, a very determined team could go in there and uh, <laughs> use Microsoft Publisher or other visual software to just measure the data right yeah. off of here. I mean, have you ever tried to read another researcher's Excel notes? They can be really wild sometimes, so <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so in uh, Figure One D and E, um, they just say for every donor how many antigens are being recognized in right. each donor, and you can see that uh, on average, right, you get this like actually they give you they give us the figures three point two CD four antigens and two point seven CD eight antigens are recognized on average, right, by every donor. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and it's interesting because like it seems that there are very few donors who react to nothing. Uh, I mean the CD. I mean if you there may be slightly more in the CD8 core help, but there's definitely some in the CD4. Which... Yes. Yeah. Um... Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely some in the CD8, right, that don't re react to anything. But Yeah, the... CD4, it's hard to say whether that's a line or not. <clears throat> I mean, for the thing is, uh, since they're sampling people at different time points, there is always <laughs> the fact that different cell abundances do change over time, so there might always be someone in the population who might... You might not have sampled their memory, or they might not have had a very good one developed because we, since yeah. we know from previous studies that sometimes the memory can be messed up for SARS-CoV-2. Um, yeah. yeah, and so like this is also where like I like that the way they varied things to give us an overview, but it shows like if you vary things, you can't say things definitively, right, yeah. about like that course of infection because you have outliers that like <laughs> you don't know why they're outliers. Um, you can't, right? You can't explain that. It could just be um, right outliers because of those initial demographics when they were when they were put into the study. Well, I mean that's I think the thing is like da messy data is very hard to work with, but it's generally I I, I quite appreciate it a lot more because they because they could have approached this by saying oh we've got some messy data but let's average everything out and just focus it on the averages and you'd get very clean grasp but you wouldn't be able to see these details and I feel sure. like. Like, they've been gone out of their way to be a lot more transparent about this because the immune response is complicated and it is messy. There are always going to be some... There's only one person who might not have had a very good immune response, and that's why they ended up in hospital with COVID in the first place, so... Yeah. They... Well, yeah, I, I don't want to... I, I don't mean to throw any shade on them oh, for yeah. using this type of... This, this certain population. All I'm trying to... I guess what I'm trying to help uh, maybe viewers understand is that, like, there are some limitations for choosing something like this. You can get at different research questions when you restrict your data to very specific yes. points but then you miss out on the generalizability, right? And so like what we're gonna get out of this study, and again, I didn't understand it when I first read through the paper is that at the end of the day, like they're gonna find something that like is average pretty good of stimulating T cells across whatever, right? Because they've like, they cast their net in this sort of wide, wide manner. <clears throat> okay, so 2AB, um, you can see that there's a wide range of receptor binding domain antibody IgG responses um on this this might be s2a actually but um and uh yeah so basically uh antibody responses are here uh you can see because these guys have all been infected before right they do have some rbd antibodies mm. um but it doesn't correlate that strongly with the amount of cd4 positive t-cells that they have yeah that i find is quite interesting because again we've, <laughs> we've been focusing on the antibody response and so we if we if we're going to judge that and say, okay, so we've got this antibody response, and that must correlate to the T cell response. But then we yeah. see here that actually they are operating somewhat independently; that they're yeah. not necessarily tied to each other. But also, mm -hmm. another thing is antibodies go up and down a lot in after infection. Yeah. So since they are sampling at all these different time points after infection, they are like they are likely to have a really real variance in antibodies, whereas the CD4 might not vary as much. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they they go even deeper into this, and they split up that that correlation, right? And they say, uh, like, what about just correlating with the specific S, M, and N, right? Like by every antigen that they have, right? Instead of saying all the CD4 responses, they can break it up um, because because they can do <laughs> yeah. because they're able to, they're able to. Um, uh, split their pools, right? Like they have different pools that that uh, tickle different areas, so they can right. just say in the pools that we expose that correlate to these different antigens, they can just see the responses from there. Um, and again, 
not very significant, especially because uh, once you, so the at p values that they're providing here, they aren't adjusted for the fact that they repeatedly did the same statistical test yeah. looking for something to hit. Um, so yeah, there's like that bias there. It doesn't seem like there's a strong correlation between the IgG levels and the uh, CD4 T cells. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is interesting because like the IgG are for, specific for RBD. So, mm -hmm. the, so they are basically finding spike mostly so yeah. if there is a connection between the rbd response it should be with the s protein at least you should see something strong and we don't mm -hmm. see anything too strong there which is interesting i mean there is a suggestion but because but i mean this if you take out the lines from that you just see this blob of a part yes. that doesn't... <laughs> yeah exactly yeah the, the computer can see something but like yeah if you look at the statistics on that the r squared or the r value right and the p values like they aren't very strong numbers right the closest i think the closer you get to one with R is like a is a is a positive correlation, right? And the p values you know, under some cutoff usually 0 0.05, 0 0.5, something like that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, um, but CD4 uh, responses that compared to like um, the C8 CD8, responses, yeah. <laughs> right? So uh, CD4 responses compared to CD8, they do see a correlation here. Uh, you can see, like, even in the clusters of dots, right, they're much tighter. <laughs> There's a yeah. lot fewer. They're just, like, sitting on the axis, right? Um, and and this this is a, another interesting sort of nugget, right, to understand what's going on. Like, I'm also maybe expected, right? Like, because they are stimulating the cells, right, they're also stimulating the CD8s. They know that they're going to be stimulating both populations of cells. Um, but, yeah, I guess there's no... Yeah, I was trying to think of what they could say, like, on the opposite side of this. Like, does it say something about CD8? To me, it just says the immune system is responding here. Like, the way that they've tickled it, um, it, it produces a response in both. And the stronger your overall cellular immune response, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's an overall effect, right? It's not just, like, stronger CD4. It could be independent from CD8. It's, like, generally, like, overall on the cellular side. Um and humoral immunity is like another 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 place to think about. <clears throat> oh, uh, maybe this this point too that you brought up in the last slide, um, because of their cohort, right? They're not seeing any. Uh, hum it's not poised to study humoral immunity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's the last time we'll see antibodies for a long time. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and in S2 ABC, they are breaking up, they just go into a bit more detail, right, to say, like, what if you, again, break it up by, um, uh, oh, yeah, you match. So, like, they were using the sum CD8 response, right, but you're actually going to now break it up per antigen, right, of the CD8 response. And those things correlate as well. And this is actually, to me, this, this point... Um, it, it's hitting back at the, it maybe ties back to that HLA point they were making, right? Mm. In a specific individual, right? If you are more likely to touch on a, a certain antigen, you will again be more likely to present that both on the CD4 side and the CD8 side. Right, yeah. I, saw, <clears throat> I, I can, yeah, I see that. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, again, it's like you would expect that. Like, that's why mm. it's in the supplement, right? Because, like, that just, that is what you would expect knowing that we have genetic inherent genetic biases right to present different things and it's nice to see that the data set reflects that as well <clears throat> for sure uh the next one looks at the epitope screen pipeline like, so we've got the we know these proteins uh, that the t-cells respond to and now we're looking to drill down further and i think they they, they talk about the hla because so hla1 spring that goes very fast because they just like put it through this program that can yeah. predict where the hla1 but HLA2 is a bit of a different beast because that's a bit more looser. It can cross react mm -hmm. more often. And so actually software predictions aren't as good for that. So they've got much more tighter pipeline for for looking and finding epitopes for it. Uh, yeah, I think they end up they end up having to like, so in HLA, they can just make a panel of, or HLA1, they can yeah. just make a panel of things. And if they come up positive on that panel, they have a good correlation between that panel's ability to stimulate HLA1 versus anything else. But yeah, HLA2, it's like, I guess, more broad. So they end up doing like other pools. Basically, they just run more overlapping pools in different ways to really drill down as to which peptides are the ones that are stimulating uh, yeah, the CD8 or the CD4 cells. Yeah, they, they go through like another round of like checking which cells are reacting to these specific antigen yeah. pools. And 
they put into smaller and smaller boxes until they figure out which one is the thing that it's reacting to, I think. Yes, uh, I think that's the way that they approach it. And actually, I also think that uh, we don't show it again, but all of this data is in the first figure. <laughs> yeah. Like, when they're showing us that first figure, it's more than just their initial screen of just the overlapping peptides. It's also all of the different peptides that they ended up uh, testing over the populations of cells. Um, yeah, so that's just, just so everyone knows. Uh, it's kind of reading this part of the paper was weird because they were like referencing back and I was like, why is this figure? I guess it's a amalgamation of all the data. <clears throat> yeah, they, they really stand out strong with that first figure to get get our attention and be like, this is these yeah. are, are all the proteins it's reacting to. And this one is how they explain the magic behind it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of yeah trying to explain how they got there. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, S4, you know, if anyone's interested, this is the huge screen of uh, the number of different peptides that they have for all the CD8 uh, antigens. And I guess, like, maybe what uh, is important here is that you see that, like, uh, basically every allele of it is equally represented in their peptide pool. So even though like some alleles aren't good at finding certain peptides on certain proteins, they still balanced out overall that they have like the same amount of epitopes in that uh, in that pool. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Um, and I think S three B is uh, maybe grounds us a little bit more on that experimental way in which that they're approaching things. This is our representative flow graphs, right? This set of graphs is behind every dot that we see in Figure One, right? That they had to do all that initial filtering, right? That they're able to separate CD eight and CD four, and then they use um, the AIM methodology, right? Ox forty, CD sixty nine, CD one thirty seven, um, and in those specific ones, they're using different pools, right? Different pools of these peptides that activate different areas. And um, this is very similar to the way that we've been talking about uh, COVID-19 testing, right? Batched COVID-19 testing, right. that same idea, right? Like if pool one and pool two interact, right? You know that like the, the interaction between those is the peptides that are uh, causing this increase. And you can even drill down to a single one just by testing multiple pools of different stuff. Yeah. Uh, and S3A, this is, uh, oh, pie charts are always fun. Um, pie charts. So uh, they, they're going to, then the next part of the paper, they're going to explain on the CD4 side and the CD8 side what they saw in terms of all the donors, right? So for the 100 donors that they have, right, um, the most common ones, oh, yeah, the most common epitopes were recognized by th uh, three or more donors. Uh, again, this is a way to stratify like what now, like more specifically, not just antigens, because before they were saying, what were the top uh, antigens that gave us an effect? Right. Now they want to know the top epitopes <laughs> because they can drill down because they've done so many different alternating pools. They can say that specific fragment that is causing more donors to be to come up positive in these AIM tests. Yeah. So these fragments can be about like 15 like peptides long <laughs> and... They're small. Yeah. And they can be overlapped. So it's it's very yeah. and yeah, and they're looking at they're really drilling down to the specific like so you can look drill down to the mutation is what we're looking for. See like what kind yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean that's that's one of the things they hint at in uh, in their uh, introduction is that like with this type of methodology you could start to say things if again your sample size was big enough your population cohort was big enough you could say this particular stretch of 15 amino acids is really important for our, for our T cells to be able to recognize right this particular pathogen. Um, yeah, so three plus donors. Actually, when you think about it, it's actually kind of it's not uh it's not a lot <laughs> three plus donors right like if the sample is a hundred of them right mm -hmm. uh but i guess they have 49 right different uh peptides here so 49 over three that gives them coverage over the entire 100 <laughs> yeah um yeah it's at least kind of confused me because uh of the way that because pie charts usually confuse me because i'm not because i'm trying to think figure out like magnitude responses what's the kind of denominator in that what's the so mm. th this was a a bit of a uh, a challenge for me to understand uh, yeah this is i would say that this is very similar to the table s3 chart 
Right. It's just like, this is the way that they're choosing to show it for the epitopes. You could have that same chart where they listed out every epitope, <laughs> right, that they tested, rank them by the frequency of people who got donor responses, right, and how many AIM responses they got. And then then you have like a really big list, right? For the, the first 49 of them would come out to cumulatively 45% of the response uh, that they experienced. Right. Uh, that, that 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 would be my like way of going through it. But let, let, let's yeah. move on. Uh, thank you. I think that's cleared it up for me a bit more. Yeah. Uh, and we've got another table where they did. Uh, jump well, to figure... uh, Sorry. Table seven is so they just want to show that uh, because basically they're going to start using um, they're going to use a program to uh, test uh, whether or not like uh, the epitopes, the peptide groups that they're picking out. Uh, if they can bind to different HLA classes. Um, because, like, uh, basically, they've been varying all the peptides. They know that the donors are all varied for HLA types, but I guess it's too complicated to actually suss that out from the data set that they have. So instead, they want to show us the relationship between, like, actually an in vitro binding study where they take every peptide across every variant of HLA they have, and they show, oh, yeah, like... Um, the top peptides they actually bind to a bunch of different hlas which makes sense we already just like that's a confirmation of what we just saw right like we know that the dominant peptides bind to th three plus donors right three plus donors the chances that their hla overlap it's not actually not that high there's so many different hla types so this is again showing that um or actually it's not again it's like moving us down this argument that uh the these for this top 49 epitopes they are able to bind different hla types that's that's where they're moving us they're, they're trying to push us down this line of logic <clears throat> right yeah uh numbers are like i guess it's in nanomolars that's probably like that's a it's an affinity number of some sort yeah. bigger numbers yeah. are binding and if you go down the row you can see that some of them have big numbers for many of the col many of the columns yeah <clears throat> oh yeah so speaking of numbers uh they, they jump from table S5 to table S7. There is no table S6, which caused me no end of, of Yeah, panic. so it's very confusing. The paper was hard to parse at this point mm. because they have so many tables, right? Because essentially what they're doing is making these big tables and ranking everything and then seeing what the top is of everything. Those tables do exist. They're not in figure form. They're in Excel form. Oh, right. <laughs> with them to put them into the presentation to show people but i was like oh my god like these are huge tables like really there's just like a, a gist that you get from them and yeah, so like yeah. i just like i'm not going to show them no that's fair <laughs> that's fair enough tables. yeah they have more tables two i think they have like s5 s6 maybe s4 doesn't exist here those are all in excel form you can find them online yeah go to the do do go, go to the <laughs> figures if people want to dive in you can see their lists here right basically um what if someone's a funny DIY scientist, you could be like, from this list, you could pick up the peptides, right? You could find the peptide that gives the response that you want, right? How they characterize them, because they're all characterized, uh, roughly at least. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So talking of tables, well, talking tables, let's go back to graphs. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to graphs. So S4 is again just showing us in S7, right? They measured in a in an assay, right? The the promiscuity, right? Whether or not these peptides could bind to different HLA types, but that basically correlates with a program that also can predict that. And so this is this is like a mini thing that they did in the paper, right? Where they're just gonna use uh, the program to give us promiscuity, and you just have to say like that's good enough. Right, because they showed us in vitro data, it correlates well. Let's not worry about it. They don't want to do that in vitro data every time they need to make a point. Right, they just want to show us the overview using this this uh, predictive tool. Net MHC two pan. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> uh, figure S four B C. So, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, oh yeah, they there. they would just want to show that the promiscuity. It's a uh, it's not something special like uh, that's driving, like, yes, these top 49 epitopes are promiscuous across 15 different types, but remember, there's more than 15 types yeah. <laughs> inside of all of, uh, inside the whole population. And so again, 
uh, they can just use their prediction software now that we know that the software is okay to use and they can predict the binding affinity for all of the different <laughs> epitopes right against all of the different um, uh, HLA types across both their cohort and their worldwide panel and they show that they're the same <laughs> uh, more or less the same yeah. right the I look the same, the average number, the median values of those graphs look the same. Um, and there, and there, there indeed is more promiscuity in the epitopes versus the non-epitopes, right? You can also choose just like random peptides oh. inside of these uh, antigens, yeah. and they don't have the same effect. They don't bind to multiple different HLA types the same way. Yeah, like going back to the first graph, this, this is taking a few things from the blue column and comparing <laughs> the things that are in the heavy red column. And then uh, those shouldn't bind, so it's a good idea to see how specific and non-specific binding is. It is so, mm -hmm. and it is good that they did the worldwide and can, their cohort as well, because it's good yeah. to see that kind yeah, of. Like, I think a big part of this paper is like they're trying to argue that like they their cohort is like representative of something. Uh, yeah, they want to show us the representative nature of it. <clears throat> right. Okay, so back to the main figures. Uh, back onto this chart basically here's the gra here's the uh those same 49 top peptides um and this is where in epitopes it's the 49 top and the non-epitopes it's like another 49 random ones right that aren't epitopes yeah so uh, and you can see that uh they're more immunodot like yeah they're they bind more of these things do so, they do this with the program i don't remember uh, i think this was actually done with uh actual two cells um well, oh no. Um, so, uh, so reading the graph, the bottom bit is the HLA type. So, for HLA types, there are three flavors: there's D, A, D, P, and D, Q, which relates mm -hmm. to like kind of the molecular structure. And I think the thing, just like if you're just looking at this like a magic eye picture, the thing you'd want to see is there's more red in the epitopes court column than the non-epitopes yeah. column. That there are some, there are some like kind of types of HLA <laughs> that are. Yeah, uh, this is the same thing. Like, uh, this is again like all the the so three things that we looked at before. That was all in the supplement, right? It's all to support this graph. This is this is not from their data. I, I mean, this is from their data in that they chose the list of forty nine epitopes from their data, but then they ran it through that um, that algorithm that said does it bind these different HLA types. So this is again this is just in silico, <laughs> but it's in silico and it and it matches up with the fact that that pie chart said that like tons of the variants can be explained by this top 49. Yeah, I mean, I think this has been through that meso pool. So this is the HLA class too. So it's been through that pipeline of not just the, it's been like, yeah. through, uh, there's been another round of selection before they went to their-, their... That's how they chose the 49, right? right? So like the reason why they have 49 here, that's how they know that there's 49 epitopes and that they can discriminate against the non-epitopes. But every like shaded, uh, shaded square that's not an experiment it's a prediction a prediction of the intersection of that uh one of the 49 or one of the non-49 against these hla types right i think i got it now because yeah. as you can probably tell i got a bit lost during this side of the paper so yeah you and me both yeah <laughs> but like uh, yeah that's 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 how it goes <clears throat> And figure S5, uh, another place where I sort of got lost because the violin plots where they're trying to compare uh, the sequence identity of the SARS-CoV-2 epitopes that they found here to common cold viruses. So Yeah. Um, and they're showing that they're basically the same. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's <laughs> weird because they show like epitopes and non-epitopes and how they both are reacted to in the same sort of way and yeah, not reactions in here just similarity just similarity okay similarity. They're, they're setting us up to show us the reactivity because they will i think they might do the reactivity tests but in this one they just want to show sequence similarity to say that there's no big sequence difference between these two things yeah there's... at least the gross level <laughs> yeah no significant differences between the epitope and non epitope controls with their counterparts in the cold virus genome so effectively mm -hmm. they're showing that they, there is some matching within there's a lot of matching yeah. between those there's a lot of matching between them yeah but in s5 they provide us with this is basically them trying to respond to that weird phenomena right where there there are um 
there are obviously T cells that respond to these antigens, right, in the uninfected population. So the way that they're explaining it is basically through this one graph to say that, like, but <laughs> the epitopes that get um, the epitopes that we see um, the CD4 responding to in COVID-19, they are uh, unique. They they're different. They're different epitopes than the ones that uh, the unexposed group is is responding to. <clears throat> Right. And this is this is purely through like reanalysis of their of old data, right? Through the lens of um, through the lens of their their understanding, right? They yeah. have they have a panel of strongly uh, strongly activating epitopes, right? That that hit a wide range of individuals, and they're they're going to say, let's compare that to some of the things that we saw before, um, and yeah, it looks like they're different. <laughs> yeah. That, that, the reason why and people just never saw it before because they were looking at smaller uh groups um yeah so so i think what they found is they re-identified their old things and they in and they found them again in this in their, this cult but they found so much more that yes that that's right not that's right big a contributor to that it it might be have effect but it's not as big as all these specific co epitopes right Yes. Yeah. The specific ones seem to be like, there's just, there is a, like, yes, unexposed serum can respond to these epitopes, to some SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. It's not the same epitopes that get responded to when someone actually gets infected. Again, like we kind of already know that from the previous literature, but they're showing that their, their approach is also giving us that information as well. And, and in some ways, maybe even stronger because they can show like this large amount of different epitopes, right? That are specific just for the people who got infected. <clears throat> right. Uh, speaking of S4A, so these, these are now looking at the... Yeah. So CD8 now. <clears throat> yeah, look, looking at CD8. Uh, and this is also looking at the different like uh, antigens and comparing their immuno, the immunodominance in donors and... I don't know why they choose to show us the CD4 and the CD8 data in kind of different ways. I think it must relate to the fact that they use different approaches to to drill down onto the epitopes for each one. Um, but essentially, this structure should mimic the CD4 <laughs> structure. Like this is the pie graphs that they were showing us, yeah. where they rank the different antigens by how many donors they um, they they tickle. <laughs> and they show that like there's a set of, well, these are the top ones, right? And they all, um, they react in multiple donors. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it, so yeah, this one's, because they had like different donors for each one, right? Uh, so there are eight HLA classes represented by just- Donors. For the whole paper, they're talking about these hundred donors that gave us blood that they tested against all the different pools. Right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and that brings us to figure 4B and 4C, which... Uh, yep. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. So, the, so again, in the gray bars, we have the frequency of positive epitopes. So I presume that means, like, the n number of positive, like, responses, just how frequently the response yep. happens. And then blue is in, the magnitude. For 100 people, what the percentage of people that were positive? Yeah. <clears throat> right. And so. And that magnitude for every cell, right? Could go, like some some people could have tons of cells that react, right? So you can see that like they should roughly correlate, but you can see sometimes like uh, in the like for the top uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? In the top eight group. All of those have magnitudes that are fairly high mm. uh, of the frequency of positive results, right? So, like, yes, there's lots of people who are uh, positive tests, and they all have, like, really high magnitudes of response. They should have given us, like, some uh, variance there, right? They should show some that have lower, I guess, frequencies have some lower responses. It's not a good correlation. It's, yeah. it's really just, uh, again, like, um, this is just, like, the overview of the data to see, like, the shape of everything that they found. <clears throat> Right for uh, yeah for sure. Uh, they split it up by the alleles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, show like I guess there are certain alleles that uh, of HLA class one, uh, right? Because we're talking about yeah. CD8s now um, that have these positives, and you can even see that there are top alleles. <laughs> uh, some alleles are better, right, at yeah. showing full epitopes. Actually, all of these are like. 
all of these alleles that are on this chart, they show us more than 10, <laughs> or almost more than 10 different epitopes get recognized by these. Which is really <laughs> good. Um... Yeah, so it, it's not, there's not the same idea of promiscuity, I guess. That maybe that's why they're showing us this data a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. It's not that a single epitope is recognized by multiple different alleles. Maybe in this case, they're more seeing that like, um, one allele can recognize multiple epitopes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe that's part of it. <laughs> it's different, right? I, I think that it's just, it's, uh, it's solidifying our knowledge of the differences between the types of epitopes that are recognized in the CD4 arm and the types of epitopes that are recognized in the CD8 arm. <clears throat> right, right. Uh... And... Uh, and once again, uh, although I don't think many papers looked at CD8 itself, uh, in figure S5b, they're again just looking at the similarities of sequence between common cold coronaviruses and... Um, the epitopes recognized by the CD8 cells. Uh, yeah, uh, same. So there's nothing about the epitopes, uh, nothing about the sequences that would explain this difference. <laughs> mm. uh, and yet... Uh, there, I mean, they don't actually show the matched, right? They don't have like a, a circle graph to reanalyze CD8 data. It doesn't, I guess people didn't do that study yet. <laughs> um, but like one would assume that in unexposed individuals, they wouldn't have CD8 positive cells that recognize the antigen. And if they did, then like we'd also have to try to explain that mystery. There, there's a bit of a mystery still that is unexplained by this paper. They, they can't explain why those unexposed ones um but they can show us more information about it i mean i think they they here they kind of paint the idea that there the there is like a response to the common cold there or that there is some sequence identity there between these common epitopes that cd8 but they don't and that could be an explanation but they don't but i think here it's muddies the water more because it shows that it's not a big part of that that this mm -hmm. is much smaller than than what was found in previous papers yes yeah for cd4s they can say that yeah. i'm not sure what they're gonna say on the CD8 True. side about it? Uh, yeah, just because they don't have maybe I, I guess maybe people haven't done those studies. Or I mean, it's negative data, right? If, mm. if it exists, and maybe that's not not published. Maybe I'm not reading it properly. That's another big explanation. Yeah, uh, this yeah, paper this is quite difficult to read. I yeah, I, the CD8 part of this, the CD8 arm of this paper. Like, I'm just like, okay, I understand uh what's going on here like what they're showing me but i don't really know the context how that um should inform the way i think about cd8 immunity and and epitopes um yeah, yeah that's... I, I guess these are things that we could like figure out with background reading i think well the more like kind of we get used to this sort of yeah. uh, I think paper reading is required for us to give a good summary of it right now it's just like a high it's just a high level description of what they 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 were describing to us <laughs> secondhand description is what we're passing on right now <laughs> yep uh <clears throat> but pipe up in the comments if you're a t-cell expert who can please, explain please. this because uh yeah we're... so uh in figure uh 5a they're gonna try to synthesize all the information they've been showing us uh and lay it out uh, across uh, some of the big proteins, right, that showed big responses. So they're doing S first, um, S yeah, protein. Yeah, spike protein. Everyone loves spike protein. It's yeah. it's everywhere. It's, um... so that, the spike protein from the previous work, right, previous stuff, we know that spike is one of the, the big contributors, right? Like it has lots of epitopes that map onto it from both CD8 and CD4. So they show that, I think, um, CD4 is at the top with the line graph right uh and they have it in uh red is the mag or red is the magnitude or the positive responders uh, black is the magnitude and then if you look at the very bottom graph that's the cd8 epitopes um red is the epitopes uh, uh red is the non-epitopes black is the epitopes <clears throat> right uh and we've got um and so in the in the one below that there's the promiscuity i think that's what it shows or so uh, that's again related to the algorithm um you can see it's all over the place <laughs> yeah right because hla class 2 like i guess maybe they're they are more promiscuous i think that that's what they said in the body of the text yeah um, just anything. So there's no, yeah there's no region of the protein that has a higher promiscuity than others um so i guess that doesn't explain why these particular regions are picked up by t-cells <laughs> 
Uh, um, just, there are like three main images. So one in the N terminal, one just outside the RBD or in near the RBD, and kind of the other one that's very much in the C air terminal area. Yeah, that's the one two. That's the fourth one, right? You can see like the the actual layout of the RBD, right? And you follow those red lines down, and that's what you just said. Those are the different regions that you're getting uh, more recognition from on the CD4 side. Right. Mm. If you look at the C8 side underneath, it's kind of all over equal. Yeah. Uh, I wish that they showed us more clustering because, like, you can do, you can see some clusters here. I would say, right? There are places where the dot, the black dots are more dense, um, yeah. and those are places that are, uh, you know, presented more on the CD8 pathway. Yeah. Um, I think something interesting here to me, there's a nice, exp there's a nice thing here in the homology. You can see that the, the regions that are most similar <laughs> to the other versions actually are not the regions that get picked out by T cells, mm. uh, which is good. That's showing us that something in the immune system is working. We don't know why, <laughs> right. but like, you know, the immune system is working because it's choosing unique areas of this protein to uh, recognize uh, on the cellular side. Right, like that whole section of the HR1, CH, CT section, there's lots of homology there with the other seasonals, um, but yeah. nothing there is like a particular uh, antigen to get recognized, epitope. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, keep going. They, yep. they give us uh, some characterization here where they say uh, there's a correlation between um, the positive uh promiscuity, the promiscuity of the responders and the binding. This is like, Again, they've shown us this already, right? That right. like um, the top 49 are also very promiscuous. Uh, so here we're seeing it, I guess, just correlated in the data. Um, but there's no correlation with the homology with uh, seasonal coronaviruses. That is good. <laughs> the immune system is yeah. working. <laughs> um, and there's also no correlation with this cleavage probability. Um, yeah. So that basically that's confusing us because it's saying that like uh, it's not like it's not like our system preferentially chooses right because of the way it it pre-processes antigens to show us these there's something else that's going at play so there could be other steps right like just because the uh, mhc presents to uh, a t-cell doesn't mean that that t-cell will end up becoming um right we were talking about checks and balances it doesn't mean that t-cell will end up becoming like sensitized to that antigen there are other steps that have to happen um, so maybe those steps are important in sort of like refining what gets recognized that that could be what this one is pointing us towards. <clears throat> right. Uh, and next up is figure six, a, where we just see, we've seen the spike protein and we've seen it before, but, uh, this is comparing it to, uh, antibody responses from another paper, um, Shrock et al, mm -hmm. which we talked about briefly last week. In fact, we, we talked about it twice accidentally, I think, um, <laughs> my bad, it was my fault. I, I but yeah, uh, and also the, yeah, this is interesting because uh, in yellow they've got the areas where the B cell attaches, and it, and the in in red they've got the the CD8 responses, and they seem to be different yep. areas, which again, different areas. yeah, that's very interesting for antibody responses, especially when you're thinking about the, these mutations that stop antibodies from binding. They might not have any effect on the T cell response based on looking at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean this is I mean again this just shows us that. You know, we don't really know how, we know that the vaccine works, <laughs> right? But we don't know how the vaccine works. We can correlate the vaccine to an increase in neutralizing antibodies, but what if it also increases like the CD4 reactivity to certain regions, right? And that's also a very important part. Um, yeah, we don't really have answers there. I guess this is like some good news potentially, right? Like this could be saying that like, we don't, again, it's very nebulous, right? Because there's nothing definite here. Nothing here is correlated with severity of disease. Nothing here is mm. correlated with the progression of pathogenesis. It's all just like what the immune system is seeing. Um, and it's just telling us that the immune system, the two arms are looking at different spots of these proteins. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be tempting to and, overread like things. So I could say, oh, we're all saved. Uh, and yeah. yeah, I think the other thing to remember is that Schrock paper, that was a machine learning yeah. like method. 
that like reduced the complexity of ev every patient down to the things that it recognized. Um, not having read that paper, it's hard to like uh, put some more criticisms onto these yellow regions. Uh, but we can <laughs> the, the red regions we do know uh, that it comes out from this paper. So we know the red regions are from a hundred different individuals, right, across mm -hmm. a wide range of clinical manifestations, um, and they are being stimulated ex vivo. Uh, so we can say something to that. Yeah. Uh, I think they also try to show us that it's not the glycosylated regions are like the chunky bits in gray. Yeah. I don't, it's hard to see. If you see things that are kind of like mini spheres of gray, those are the glycosylated sites. Um, and they're saying that the recognition is not influenced by the glycosylation sites. <clears throat> Okay, so in 5B, uh, they're looking at another protein, N protein, nuclear capsid, yep. very, um, uh, nu or, sorry, nuclear protein, it's not a capsid. Uh, and it's a very uh, abundant protein, it binds to the genome. Um, this also has particular hotspot regions. Yep. Uh, in these hotspot regions, they are more uh, uh, closer to the homology, right, of those yeah. different, uh, different things. And uh, that actually does correlate to what we saw in uh, the earlier papers, right? Where it was like the difference between N and NSP. There's like yeah. more N dominant, um, the ones that cross react. Uh, the pattern that you see in CD8 cells is <laughs> not, not a pattern, also still not a pattern. Everything's just like dotted all the way across I the mean, protein. If you, if you don't look at the dots and look at the blank areas, there are there's different areas that don't seem to be coming up on there. So, um... yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's, they, a, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> so there is a pattern, but it's not—it's hard to pick it out because, again, there, there doesn't seem to be as many dots. There doesn't seem to be as many much coverage of the genome of these epitopes. So it's hard to say, like with certainty. Right, because I guess uh, non-epitopes, right, like are equally interspersed between them all. Yeah. Oh, so, I, I just know that I, I wish that there. I don't understand enough. So what, what's come up from this paper is I don't understand why the CD4 and CD8 data are shown differently. Right. Right. That's like the main, I'm not equipped to understand those differences part that I, I got from reading this paper. Um, but obviously there are significant differences that allow us to say with different levels of confidence stuff about them. But yeah, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I see this paper is, yeah, just solidified a lot of like blank spots in my immunology knowledge. <laughs> Uh, okay, but going back to uh, the flow of the paper, they show us again there's a, there's a correlation between the promiscuity of binding and the frequency of positive responders. Uh, again, that's CD4 <laughs> that they're looking at there. Um, there's not so much a correlation between the homology or the cleavage sites. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Same uh, stuff. Uh, and before. then we're mapping on the actual protein map. And again, we're seeing the antibody responses versus the T cell responses. And, and again, Are different. Yeah. Again, we see things are different. Uh, then we can move swiftly on to uh, <clears throat> M protein, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll just okay. We, if we can go back to the N protein. Oh yeah. Okay. I, the N protein though, that's all inside yeah. cells. Right? Yeah. You're never going to surface N. So the fact that there are red regions like over the surface of this, um, or sorry, yellow. Oh, right, uh, sorry yellow regions right that's kind of interesting that there are yeah. things that are b cell dominant because like they aren't actually shown on the outside at all um anyways it's just like another yeah. puzzle basically that, that gets opened up <laughs> i mean my, my theory would be like cells pop open and you see all these proteins come out and b cells are reacting to that perhaps and absolutely but absolutely that's like anyway uh m protein which is a matrix protein which should be expressed so, well no it's b because the envelope is on the side so you wouldn't so this wouldn't necessarily be exposed to antibodies this would be more more <clears throat> yeah this could be embedded in the membrane in a certain way i don't really know how this correlates to the inside outside um this one's a lot different it, like it's a smaller protein right there's not a lot um but you can see like they have kind of this like maybe a bit more activity over the whole surface of it there's there's more of it that is a um a cd8 epitope this yeah. protein is a lot more CD8 than it is CD4, I guess, is something that could be said. Mm -hmm. It's a very, I think it's a very abundant protein. That's why it's coming up as one of the top, um, yeah, the top proteins. Yeah. Uh, let's just 
plow through, I guess, S5, JKL, same stuff that we saw before, a correlation between promiscuity and CD4 binding and positive responders, but not in any of the other two. Um, yeah. And this, I don't think they have a structure for it. This was like a, they predicted this structure through some computational methods. Um, yeah, so their structure, again, this one has no no uh, antibodies on it, so... Um, uh, but yeah, it's these are mostly in the transmembrane min region, apparently, where it's very hard for antibodies to bind. Uh, yeah. So again, it's like maybe what we're seeing is like it's all that proteolytic processing, right? That's why these come up in the screen that we're looking at now. Yeah. Um, uh, and then figure so as give us the top portion of the graphs, right? All the figure five graphs. They give us the top portion of that for a bunch of other proteins. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so... To see that between the frequency of responses and just how it over the whole proteins so some uh, basically uh, you can see that some proteins have like a more even distribution right of where yeah. the topes lie and others it's only in like certain hot spots yeah so I mean this is more hot spotty than because the NSP3 is very hot spotty the one at the bottom is like very spikes of very specific areas and if there's a mutation mm -hmm. in that then that then suddenly you get an entire epitope that doesn't show up anymore but yeah um whereas with aura of eight there's that's a lot more promiscuous you've got like a lot more things that the t cells can react to and for sure as we for go sure. down this like length of like epitopes we suddenly see that the, the amount of things that get bound to by the hla slash mhc is uh, it gets smaller so yeah that kind of tells a story in itself of like why why these proteins certain proteins don't show up as much yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this, again, it's all the same data, right? Like, in some ways, it's just showing us across the length of the protein. But yeah, it's clear that there are immunodominant, right? Some proteins contribute a lot more to the immune system being recognizing it than others. Um, and so, I mean, those are the proteins that we should be thinking about. And those are the proteins that we be also be worried about if they're mutating. But again, like, it, they have to mutate in very specific spots in order to have the uh, yeah, the the blindness on them, and and we can't really uh, speak to it, right, in this mm. um, in this paper, <laughs> yeah. because they're not looking for uh, the relevance to disease at all, right? It's it's very much like uh, this tool. And actually, in figure, oh, okay, let's look at uh, table S one. Table S one, yeah. So, so this is a... oh, Sorry, go you ahead. Want... You, I let you go. I mean, you you're on a good run. No, no, no. I've been blabbling. I, I want you. Okay, to speak. right. So. So previously you've been looking at uh, like the uh, 99 people. Um, so they've got they've analysed that right down. They've really paired it up. But now after a certain amount of time, there's not really much more you, mean, you can find out. You're reanalyzing the same data, so you can get a sort of myopia from analysing. Mm -hmm. So this is a new cohort. So they basically take everything they've learned from this original cohort and they're testing it into a new cohort of 31 uh, COVID-19 convalescent co co uh, patients and also yep. some uh, healthy Most. donors as well. Um, yeah, and I think the focus here is that what did they learn from that original 100 cohort? They made a list of epitopes yeah. <laughs> that react in them. So, like, this is this is to me, like, again, I didn't understand this before I started reading the paper, but by the time you get to this figure, you're like, okay, this is what they're providing to us. They've found the epitopes that should react amongst a lot of different people, and now they're going to test them in, like, a new cohort to show us that, yeah, these really are the epitopes that, that can produce a T-cell response yeah i really like that they've done this because it's almost like they've done their own replication study within this study to confirm their results yeah and it, it's it's very application focused uh figure seven right because it's saying okay so what what can you even do with a pool of epitopes yeah we know like the general reactivity across these different uh proteins but what can you do with it and i think what they're pushing us towards is that you can test people's blood to see if they've been exposed right uh, from sars cov2 <laughs> Um, <clears throat> you can see these responses. So yeah. they do them in CD4 first. They take PBMCs from donors. They give them the uh, the epitope pools, uh, but also epitope pools that have been discovered in other papers. <laughs> yeah, this is why I call this the flexing figure, where they just flex on other papers. So they've uh -huh. got CD4 R RNS, which is a different paper, and C and the EC class two, which is from another paper, and they compare these two papers epitopes to their ones. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and they show that, like, uh, it's pretty good. They, it gets good resolution between unexposed and exposed. Uh, but you can still see there's huge variation, right, in these mm. groups. So they can find it on average. 
the relevance to individual testing is still like, uh, who knows, right? Because like some people won't be responding uh, to exposure, right, uh, to these antigens. Or rather, right. some people will be exposed responding but they're not exposed individuals <laughs> so, right so like that's also not a good thing uh, yeah. from the diagnostics point of view so you basically <clears> want some uh, to get a set of epitopes that will select for people for COVID-19 only and not for these background coronavirus epitopes yeah exactly exactly uh but anyways it works both in their aim which is much more sensitive you can see like the scale bar is very different from a yeah. versus um this is a very sensitive thing that they have with the aim test which i think is a good thing um yeah yeah i mean first of all that's basically so aim directly like analyzes the t-cells themselves and say okay whereas whereas first what's a bit more indirect it goes okay and they're producing this cytokine so yeah. you're basically measuring a level of cytokine produced by these to infer that so there's that whole step that separates it and i think aim kind of aims to be better um. Yeah, it, it, it does. It does aim to be better, but uh, producing cytokine is is closely related to the functional aspect of those cells. Mm -hmm. So, like you can say that that's a good assay because it's getting close to the functional. But then that confounder, because you're adding cytokines and things to tickle things, you also might be getting naive stimulation. And so, like uh, I don't know. There's like it's like there are pros and cons to each version. I would say of these yeah. assays. Yeah. <clears throat> but they're showing both because they want to show like how their peptide pool stacks up to these other peptide pools. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. CD8 uh, figure CD7 CD is the CD8 epitope pools. They see a similar um, thing that their pool is stacking up quite well. <clears throat> yeah. And now they decide to flex and see. Okay. How much? Can, how bet good can we uh, tell the difference between people who've had COVID infection and people who haven't? based on mm. these epitopes and how the T-cells react. And this is where yep. you get the receiver operator characteristic curves. Um, yeah, really as if this was an assay of some sort, right? As if this was a diagnostic, like let's uh, see those true positives versus the false positives, right? And see if like our epitope pool is better at discriminating between the unexposed and the exposed individuals. Um, and yeah, these graphs I think have a better uh, true positive to false positive rate. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. they they definitely. I mean, look, yeah, it looks like almost like, yeah, it looks scarily like accurate. Even though there isn't really much like data points there for, for a little bit. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, they, they haven't done like the full work to show that they've made a good diagnostic tool. But really, there it might not be a diagnostic tool, right? Mm -hmm. It might also just be a way to say like this is a this is a really good peptide pool. Like if you want to stimulate uh your your t cells of choice right with peptides that are specific for sars cov2 choose our peptide pool <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but they do try to tie it into diagnostics uh, in ijkl because they say okay well if we were doing a diagnostic test you wouldn't have a lot of cells because you're just gonna have a small blood draw um and so let's see the minimum number of cells right titrate down the number of cells we're using this test that we can still see a positive result um, and they show that actually, you know, when you're getting down to that 50 cells, uh, or not 50, 50 times 10 to the power of three cells per well, um, they're getting a, a positive response where some of those other pools are not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, again, mm -hmm. like, I would have hoped that, they, so for one of these graphs, I really hoped that they would have had lines to indicate, uh, like, the averages or how, but, um, but they are basically showing their point. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's interesting because uh, I so I think that's all the figures we have for this paper. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. So yeah, so it's a very basic immunology paper, right? Like the aim of it was to show us an overview, right, of all the different epitopes uh, of all of a, in a hundred different individuals where their where their HLA types. I think that's the biggest contribution of this paper is that they have this like definite information that their data set is not biased too much by HLA type. <laughs> or if it is biased, you can see what the bias is. <laughs> yeah, I want to point out that when we say basic, we don't mean simple, because this paper was not simple. We mean oh, this, yeah. this is very much like core basic science, as in for like looking at a question and investigating it for intellectual. And we're not really thinking too much about the applications. We're just trying to find yeah. out as much as possible. 
Yeah, because uh, we're also not mapping this to like disease, disease severity and stuff like this. So we're also yeah. not learning about like what correlates to worse or better disease states. It's very much just from the thing like lots of people are infected by SARS-CoV-2. They're going to respond in different ways. What can we say about the immune system's response? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it does. There are some takeaways that are quite useful, I think, if you're thinking about treatment and vaccines is that. Okay, there are lots of antibody variants, but there is a difference between that and the T cell variants. And these epitopes. The difference. I, yeah, I like that learning that we got. <clears throat> yeah, and these epitopes, they, they can be very discrete. And almost like the thing that they wanted to say in the, the paper, I think they put this in the discussion, was that we, we well, with the new variants of SARS CoV 2 discovered, there's a lot of fear about the, but uh, there actually is a lot of variation in the T cell response. And there might not be that same level of fear about mutations when we're looking at the T cells. Because they're they as we've seen they react to almost all parts of the protein and yeah and... yeah maybe because uh, I mean there were still in spike at least there are still hot spots right and we also don't know like that recognition how that maps onto protection right it's easier to say how the recognition of antibodies maps onto protection right because we have that neutralizing antibody assay yeah but like here we don't have that <laughs> as much. Yeah. Um, so it's more difficult, yeah, to get at. <clears throat> Everything with T cells is far more complicated, and I tend to think of T cells being the more important cell for the virus response. But mm -hmm. but it's so much more difficult to to analyze than antibodies. You can't just take a because you have to make take enough T cells to figure out if you've got the right amount of like T cells to get a good sample to figure out what's going on. And even then, you have to keep in mind the HLA epitopes. You have to keep in mind all this other stuff in order yeah. to figure out. Uh, what like what effect will a mutation have? Well, that depends on what HLA epitope you have. Well, that depends on uh, how much T cells you have, and there's yeah. all these other complicated things. Because this is a recent paper, what I did kind of like is that um, you can see the overview of what we know about the immune, the, the T cell immune response inside of people. It's not a lot, actually, right? Like the first figures that we showed at the beginning of this presentation, like that is like some of the most recent information that ha that we know of like the contribution of T cells in the infection. And so like uh, there's a big gap in like we need better animal models to give us like um, like a toy example of where T cells are actually contributing to the clearance of the disease but we're also limited because we don't know what to what to measure in those models that will correlate back into humans um to show us like what is the human response that we know is protective um yeah, yeah. there's like a big it really highlighted a lot of gaps that we have in being able to translate this knowledge into the into into humans yeah i mean we i mean this that has shown like a more sensitive assay that could like they demonstrated that that, Absolutely. that can be used. Absolutely, yeah. assay is really good. Uh, it would be good to, um, yeah. I mean, just using that assay in um, in different populations, maybe. Maybe if they they uh, pick their cohort differently and they stratified it differently, we could learn stuff about the human response and disease. <clears throat> but yeah, that's going to be difficult because uh, part of the hard things about studies like this is actually finding participants who are willing to to take part and yeah, it is yeah. very that's going to be quite difficult but i can imagine like some in some in vitro studies of just looking at like different hla types and how they bind to different things and then mm -hmm. feeding forward from that you can do more basic science to inv investigate kind of the core of how these hla types work in response to this virus and yeah then... absolutely and i guess uh, again like they were so careful looking at hla types but what they produced is a, a panel of epitopes right that presumably work across all those different hla types Right, like we'll work like because of their panel is chosen in this like uh, from this group. Like we know that it's gonna give us a pretty good response whoever we come across, right? And we and we we interrogate their T cells. So it's a research tool yeah. for sure. And They've given us a research tool. And this list of epitopes, you can actually try and compare those against circulating SARS-CoV-2 strains and see what's mutating, what, what's changing. Because I think mm -hmm. there have been some studies where they've been measuring like parts of SARS-CoV-2 genome that are mutating that might, might correlate to epitopes potentially and you can see maybe where there's yeah. selection going yeah, on yeah 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 and when we get better data to know like what are the things that are being recognized from the vaccine then you can also map it onto this right and you can say oh the vaccine is like directing our response to very specific areas right where people that got infected their their the areas that they get directed to is different 
then that could argue for like, oh yeah, we really, even if you've been infected before, you do still need to be vaccinated, right? Or even starting to compare from a mechanistic point of view, this vaccine is better than another because it's like uh, picking up on this area that isn't often picked up on, right, uh, by our immune system. So it's like it's going to have a good effect, something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's that stuff is like many studies away, though. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I do like the idea of like seeing like the T cell responses to vaccines and to these different vaccine strains, then seeing mm -hmm. where the epitopes of the vaccine might ch might differ from the circulating strains and whether might, that might have an effect on the T cell responses. <laughs> Um, yeah. So yeah, this is why I, why I'm quite glad we looked at this paper because again, there's a, there's people who are looking into this right now so, who are saying like, okay, well, there's vaccine. We've seen that it's not in B cells, but uh, there's also like some studies coming out with T cells going. Actually, T cells are still doing fine, and in the early stage of the infection, in the so I know there was that study with like 11 people that I looked at a while yeah. back where like they found that oh, people who had a T cell response early tended to respond better. better yeah yeah absolutely i mean that yeah. was with 11 people but i'm hoping that maybe that's and since and the thing i'm hoping glad with this paper is it showed that spike is still important in the t-cell response uh mm -hmm. which which means that those vaccines could still be because my my worst case scenario would be like okay the spike only acts for the b cells and antibodies the rest it just doesn't do anything so i'm like okay but here it's there's i think there's a lot of hopeful things that we can bring to this paper even though it doesn't this paper doesn't intend to do that. There's, this paper does not no. make any attempt to, yeah. say, look at treatment or hope. It's just mostly just how do T-cells work? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, I think uh, if that was interesting for people, uh, join us next week for Newsweek, uh, where we're going to cover um, a survey of different papers to find something that we can nerd out about, like, for one and a half hours, just like today. <laughs> yeah, and we want to remind everyone that... Well, that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and we're somewhat qualified, it's possible that we didn't get everything right. And well, science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any comments, just put, put them in the doobly doo, well, underneath the doobly doo in the comment section below. Um, yeah, you can reach out to us uh, over Twitter and the hashtag MicroTWJC. Um, we hope that you enjoyed joining us on this peer review process, and we want more people to participate and uh, ask us those questions or uh, leave us those comments. Um, so if you think you have something that, to add or find, uh, just let us know. Yeah, it's been a pleasure geeking out with you, Danny. <laughs> Same here, Fuzz. See you uh, next week. See you next week. <laughs>